Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches English Language. This video is going to concentrate on the Edexcel English Language GCSE Paper 2, Section A. This is the paper where you're given two non-fiction extracts where you have to answer a series of questions, eight questions in total. It is quite a long paper and that's why I am going to split this walk and talk into three. So this video is going to focus on questions one to three only, although it will give you an overview of the paper in that first couple of slides. So without further ado, let's get started. OK, so let's have a little look at what's on the paper. So. First off, we've got text A and three questions that go with this particular text. The first two questions are all about information retrieval. So you're just finding the information, finding the relevant quotes. But they're both worth two marks. So it is quite worthy, four marks potentially, just from finding quotes. And then you have question three, which is the biggie. This is the analysis of language and structure, and it's worth 15 whole marks. You then have a look at text B and you have another three questions. Questions four and five are very similar to the first part of the paper where it's just information retrieval. And then question six is a 15 marker and this is assessing assessment objective four, which is evaluation. So at the moment, there are some real similarities to paper one, you know, your language and structure question and your evaluation question, although the language and structure question is a bigger one on this paper. But sadly, you are not yet done because there is then two questions, 7a and 7b, that ask you to look at the text together. 7a is worth six marks, and it's actually just information retrieval. It's a lot easier than it seems. It asks you to comment on similarities in content with quotes, and that's it. 7b, however, which is worth 14 marks, is slightly trickier because that is asking you to compare and contrast being analytical as you go and focusing on the ideas and perspectives of both writers. Now, really, the distinguishing factor in this paper is who can get to the end, because, you know, this is and this is only the first half of the paper. You've still got the section B transactional writing to go to at the very end of this. So you have to keep your eye on the time. And the best way to do this is to think timings one minute for one mark. So if it's a 15 mark question, you spend 15 minutes writing. If it's a six mark question, you spend six minutes writing. And that gives you about 15 to 20 minutes to do your reading as well. So what we're going to focus on in this video particularly is text A, questions one to three. I'm breaking this up into three sections because it is such a long uh, paper. It, it warrants three whole videos. So let's start with a process that will help you navigate your way through the process. It's called the Bacquara. Now, you may remember this um, from my video on the 19th century paper. It's exactly the same thing, but it should just, just make you feel a little bit more secure starting the exam. Take some deep breaths. You know how to do this. Start with the Bacquara. Let's remind ourselves what it means. P is for preview. So that's when you read the blurb that you're given by the examiner. You have a, just a sort of brief little glance at the text just to see what it looks like. You read the questions to make sure that you kind of know and you mark them out on the paper where the bits are that you need. You read it and again and then a little bit more because the most important thing is that you actually understand the content of these extracts. You respond, i.e. you write your answers and then you review. Now I've given this advice before on previous videos, I'm going to give it again because it's so important. Review as you go. Try not to leave it all to the last minute, you know, when you're one tired and two running out of time. If when you're writing the longer questions you write a paragraph and then check it through, you're more likely to one, pick up on the mistakes, but two, not make them again. So write a paragraph, check you're hitting your assessment objectives, then move on. That's the Bacquara. So we're going to do it. We're going to start, first of all, 
by reading the blurb. Now, this particular um, PowerPoint is focused on a specimen text or a sample text. I've put a link to it in the comments so you can see it in front of you. But I have also I've, I've got them on the slides as well so you can see it in front of you. But the blurb, the italicised bit at the beginning of text A, simply says this. This text is from a newspaper article about a recruitment drive for MI6. OK, so that doesn't give us much. Um, but the fact that it's a recruitment drive means that the person writing it is going to be speaking quite positively. We might get a little bit of uh, persuasive devices in there. And we know that it's a newspaper article. So we're going to expect things like headlines, short paragraphs in the work. So now the next part of the preview is when you simply look at the text. Now, I'm not going to read it to you right now. We'll read it in a moment, but we're just going to look. So I, I kind of take a look and I'm like, oh, right. OK, we've got a sort of emboldened headline. Yep, quite short paragraphs. Oh, that's a little bit longer as it's kind of developing through. I can see that there is some. Uh, some quotes, there are some people being referenced, maybe people that are part of MI6. OK, and then back to quite shorter paragraphs. I'm just I'm just looking, just sort of having a little glance through. I'm now done my preview, I'm now going to the questions. So I'm just going to have a little read, just questions one to three at this moment. And I'm going to mark them out on the paper. OK, so in lines 41 to 49, so I'm going to find that. Identify two requirements needed by people to be recruited by MI6. OK, it's not too bad. In lines 10 to 18, give two types of people MI6 want to recruit. You may use your own words or quotations from the text. OK, so I'm going to mark that out, lines 10 to 18. That's not too scary. Ooh. Question three, analyse how the writer uses language and structure to interest and engage the readers, focusing on language features and techniques, structural features and techniques, and the effect on the reader. OK, guess what, guys? This question stays the same. It's always for this paper, language and structure to interest and engage the reader. Always, always, always. So that's something that is a given. All right. This is a 15 marker. That means that that's where we're going to spend the most time. 15 minutes, obviously, of writing. OK, so let's imagine we've marked it out. Now we're going to start doing our read through. Um, I'm for the sake of this, I'm going to just take you to the parts of the paper um, that we need for questions one and two. So, oh yeah, and read, read and read again. I, I can't labour that point enough. It's so important that on your first read through that you're taking it in, not just feature spotting. So make sure that you really, really 100% know what's happening in every bit. So. Question one was in lines 41 to 49, identify two requirements needed by people to be recruited by MI6. So this is the section. The selection process takes nine months for a successful candidate, beginning with the online application form. Applicants must be British. There's an answer. And hold a two, uh, two, two degree or above. There's another answer. So immediately, just like that, you've got two marks. Up to 80% of applicants fail the application form. Half the applicants selected for full interview fall at that hurdle. Half the remainder fail the second interview. The process continues with an assessment course. 5% of applicants fail personal vetting. What kind of people do SIS want in their recruitment intro? Motivated problem solvers. There's another answer. People who don't crave the limelight. People who are good at building relationships. So any of those answers will do. What you mustn't do is put down too much of the text okay you've got to make sure that you're showing what your answers are you genuinely could get that full two marks simply by going british and then on the next line two two degree degree and that will get you it so you've almost like clawed back some time because that's not going to take you two minutes to read to write down okay question two was looking at lines 10 to 18 two types of people mi6 want to recruit okay here we go SIS, popularly known as MI6, Britain's Foreign Intelligence Service, which this year celebrates its 100th birthday, has tiptoed into the modern world. Faced with the threat of international terrorism, it's had to cast its nets wider than the cloisters of Oxbridge and a few other favoured universities to find recruits who look the part. OK, people who look the part. That increasingly means people from ethnic minorities. There are your two answers. You can go forward because there are more answers in the next bit. There is a demand for more women. 
not just blue stockings. Now, you'll note that it's got a little three there. That means that there's a glossary at the end. It means educated women. So not just educated women, but the kind who know what to do with scatter cushions. Only that could explain the presence of good housekeeping, so people that read good housekeeping. At a recent SIS press conference held at Tate Modern in London, intended to stimulate more applications from target groups. Target groups. So there are your answers. But these two, they're the first ones there and they're really easy. So again, two marks. You've got four marks out of four. You're at 100%. It's going well. But now let's get on to the slightly trickier stuff. So question three, again, is about using language and structure, how the writer uses language and structure to interest and engage readers. Now, bear in mind, when you're looking at these texts, when it says readers, it doesn't mean you sat in the GCSE hall writing your answer. It means the intended readers. OK, so the people that are reading that newspaper article, potentially people who are genuinely considering joining the MI6 or people who are interested in MI6. OK, so you've got to remember that you're not necessarily the reader. So you've got to put yourself in, in the, the shoes of the person who is the reader and think, right, how are they being interested and engaged? What do I need to know? 15 marks, so 15 minutes. If you don't comment on both language and structure, you're not going to get past six marks. So it's actually a cap. So if you only spoke about word choices, you're not going to get past six marks. And that's the very top. So you'd have to write something absolutely spectacular about language in order to get that six marks. So, you know, really, you're, you're potentially looking at three, four out of 15. So it's so important that you, you, you handle both of them. Now, Unlike in the 19th century paper, where you get this like little paragraph or so to comment on, they want you to focus on the whole extract, which means that as well as the usual sentence level structure, they also want you to look at whole text structure as well. We're going to talk about what that means. But first of all, just a quick reminder about the language and sentence level structures. The language side of things hopefully feels quite kind of familiar for you. Things like metaphors, simile, personification, hyperbole, that means sort of over exaggeration, alliteration on a matapia. If you can't find devices, you can still make wins with language just by looking at the impact and effect or the connotations of particular words and phrases. OK, for bonus marks, if you're able to label them correctly with words like noun, verb, adjective, adverb, well, that's a plus because you're using critical terms. But if you're struggling to find those devices, then, yeah, just think to yourself, why that word? Why is they use that word instead of that word? What's the effect? What does it make the reader feel? And you're still hitting language. Sentence level structure. Things like repetition within a sentence, triads or rule of three, you might say list of three, any of that works. Sentence length or sentence structure and its effect, always the effect. Sentence functions, so things like imperatives, exclamatives, interrogatives and declaratives. Juxtaposition or contrast, OK? So these are all your sort of sentence level things. Now, if there's if you're uncertain about things like your sentence structures or sentence functions, do have a little look in my spelling, punctuation and grammar playlist because there are some good videos there helping you to identify and explore the impact of those sentence features. You can also talk about things like the sequencing of events in a text or the order of the paragraph and order of the paragraphs, sorry. And you can think about the paragraph lengths themselves. So you might find yourself looking at a cheeky one sentence paragraph that is obviously there to create a bit of drama and impact. So those are structural devices, mainly sentence level that you can look at. But what I want to talk to you now about now is the idea about whole text structure. So whole text structure basically means how the text opens and closes, so the beginning and the ending. So it might be that they're very different, they might be contrasting, they might have parallel ideas, they might repeat a theme. Juxtapositions or, oh, sorry, which I've just said, so juxtapositions or parallels between the beginning and the ending, so what's similar, what's different. 
where there are changes, so shift in tone or a shift in topic, and then that paragraph order and the way those paragraphs are introduced, so things like discourse markers. So these phrases are really useful as a way of opening discussion about whole text structure. So the opening of the text is particularly engaging. Obviously, you've got to finish the sentence because halfway through the text, there is a shift in tone. You can say, well, what is different? The author guides the reader through discourse markers. So things like, on the other hand, in contrast, those would be good discourse markers to show difference. And then the ending paragraph parallels the opening because, or you could say the ending paragraph juxtaposes the opening because. OK, so these sentence starters are demonstrating or they're using signals to the examiner that you're dealing with whole text structure. So they're really, really useful. So what you want to do is you actually want to take those ideas and use it to guide your annotation, so your understanding of the extract, but also your paragraphs that you're writing yourself. So my advice to you would be to look at these three questions. How does it open? Where does it change? How does it end? And if when you're reading the extract, you have that in your mind, how does it open? And you think to yourself, oh, actually, that opening is really engaging because it asks a question to the audience. There's your opening. Then when you quote it, you're going to talk about the fact that it's a rhetorical question, structural device. You're going to talk about some of the content in there, the language. Where does it change? That gives you opportunity to, I don't know, talk about two, maybe three different changes. So using those ideas there's a shift in tone as it moves towards. And then how does it end? So use those three questions to help you navigate the text and then use those three questions to help you formulate your topic sentences and the content of your paragraphs. And in a moment, I'm going to show you an example of that. But first, we're going to have a little look at the text itself. OK, so we're asking our question, how does it open? I'm going to read you the opening couple of paragraphs, all right? And I want you thinking to yourself, right, what can I see? How does it open? What's engaging about the way that it begins? Psst, want to join MI6? As Britain's Foreign Intelligence Service celebrates its 100th anniversary, Neil Tweedy gets an insight into MI6's latest recruitment drive. Recruiting for HM Secret Intelligence Service used to be a subtle, stylish business. One afternoon in term time, a promising undergraduate at Oxford or Cambridge would find himself invited to tea with a college talent spotter. In the quiet of an oak panelled study, the potential recruit, right school, right family, would be subjected to gentle interrogation over crumpets before being asked, clink of spoon on China, if he had ever considered official work. If the encounter provided satisfactory, the candidate received a letter inviting him to an interview. Fast forward three years and there is our man in a crumpled linen suit, sitting in a Lisbon cafe, sizing up his target, a Czech military attaché. OK, cracking start. By the way, this is a sample, so this is something that Edexcel did put together. Now, for me, if I was looking at this, I would be thinking to myself, whoa, what a cracking opening. Yeah, so you've got pssst got this minor exclamative it's onomatopoeic and it makes you think about secrets doesn't it because when you go Psst, it's like trying to get someone's attention on the quiet and then look we've got a rhetorical question question want to join mi6 so the audience is being addressed directly there's nothing more engaging than that someone asking you a direct question and it's really conversational as well so it kind of this idea that you know, people joining MI6, it's not a stuffy affair anymore, is really encapsulated in that headline. Other things that I might look at is, you know, I might look at these adjectives, the fact that it used to be a subtle, stylish business, so suggesting a kind of sense of sophistication. So it's talking about how it used to be or how it used to be perceived, might comment on the sibilance there as well. But I like this. 
I like this bit, this sort of anecdotal storytelling that's going on that sets the scene of this, uh, you know, little interview happening in Oxford or Cambridge. You've got the quiet oak panelled study. You've got these lovely moments of parenthesis, right school, right family. So all of this is drawing attention to what is perceived to have been the way that people in MI6 were recruited, that they came out of Oxbridge universities and it was all very very fancy gentle interrogation over crumpets so it's all very tongue-in-cheek this little bit so two or three easy things to talk about in terms of the opening so now let's look at where does it change so again we're thinking about that shift in tone so this was the last thing that we read fast forward three years and there's our man in a crumpled linen suit etc here's the change SIS, popularly known as MI6, Britain's Foreign Intelligence Service, which this year celebrates its 100th birthday, has tiptoed into the modern world. Faced with the threat of international terrorism, it has had to cast its net wider than the cloisters of Oxbridge and a few other favoured universities to find recruits to look the part. That increasingly means people from the ethnic mi minorities. There is a demand for more women too. Not just blue stockings, but the kind who know what to do with scatter cushions. Only that could explain the presence of good housekeeping at a recent SAS press conference held at Tate Modern in London, intended to stimulate more applications from target groups. OK, so where's our shift in tone? Our shift in tone is moving from the hypothetical interview scenario of the past to the reality of the presence. So this is where we would use uh, this is the quote that we will probably use to demonstrate that shift in tone. And what's brilliant about it is that there are some really lovely language features as well, because we've got this beautiful uh, little bit of personification about tiptoeing into the modern world. And again, notice the connotations of that verb tiptoeing. Again, it suggests subtlety and secrecy and being quite careful, you know, just as you imagine a spy would behave. Then the rest of the two paragraphs, it sort of lists all of the types of people that MI6 would want to recruit. Again, busting some of the myths or the kind of stereotypical beliefs of who they want to see. And so obviously you're going to look for more shifts, aren't you? So again, let's look at this one. So the last thing that we just read intended to stimulate more applications from target groups now a new shift. It was a curious affair, a rare venturing out of the shadows for serving SIS officers, but also very conventional. Work you can believe in, colleagues you can trust, promised the displays. There were four of them, a historian from the cabinet office called Mark, a senior SIS recruiting officer called John, and two young officers, Catherine and Nick. No one asked if these were their real names, but it would have been disappointing if they were. John would have stood out in a crowd, tall, elegant, 40s, patrician. But Nick and Catherine were very normal. He was black, 30s, smart, typical young businessman. She was attractive, friendly, early 30s. Might have been a French teacher. OK, so what's our shift in tone? So we've gone from the hypothetical what they want to very specific individuals that are actually already a part of of MI6. So there is our shift in tone or shift in topic, you might say here. And there's plenty to talk about. OK, so again, we've got this metaphor, a rare venturing out of the shadows. So suggesting that the agents are lurking in the darkness, but on this occasion they come out into the light. We've got this listing of characteristics, this kind of reminder of, you know, what normal people they are. Now, Back to the idea about the questions. The next thing you're thinking about is how does it end? So the last two paragraphs of the text. The selection process takes nine months for a successful candidate, beginning with the online application form. Applicants must be British and hold a 2-2 two, uh, two, two degree or above. Up to 80% of applicants fail the application form. Half the applicants selected for first interview fall at that hurdle and half the remainder fail the second interview. The process continues with an assessment course. 5% of applicants fail personal vetting. What kind of people do SIS want in their recruitment intray? Motivated problem solvers who do not crave the limelight. People who are good at building relationships. You may have to ask people to supply information that may place them in danger. OK, so the question, how does it end? Well, 
it ends with a rhetorical question. OK, so another moment of directly addressing the reader, just like at the start. But it's ending on that kind of factual information, the real information about who is wanted. And we get an actual quote from the MI6 about what they want. You could also comment on the fact that the ending is actually quite factual. So it moves away from this sort of sensationalized storytelling tone and moves to the actual hard facts of what people want. So do you notice there that as I read through, by using those questions, how does it open? Where does it change? How does it end? I've guided my annotations, I've guided my analysis, and I've got a real clear sense of what I'm going to write. Now I'm going to show you a model, just one paragraph, because I'd like you to have the opportunity to go away and write more should you wish. So here we go. First off, I'm just going to read it through and then I'm going to take you through what I've done. The opening of the text is particularly engaging because of the way it addresses its reader directly. It catches the reader's attention. Psst, want to join the MI6? The use of the onomatopoeic minor exclamative psst not only calls to the reader in a colloquial voice, but also carries connotations of secrecy appropriate to the topic of this piece. This is immediately followed with a rhetorical question, encouraging the readers to consider joining MI6. It is an elliptical phrase, missing the do you, adding to the informal tone. This is important as they are attempting to engage a new audience in their recruitment drive, breaking the stereotype that all spies are taken from Oxbridge universities. OK, so that's my opening gambit. But let's look at why this paragraph is a model, why it's a cracking one. So. First off, my topic sentence addresses whole text structure. I'm using that model, OK? But the fact that I've actually used the phrase the opening is particularly engaging. I'm highlighting, ah, yeah, they're deliberately crafting the opening in that way. Whole text structure, OK? I then, after my quotation, start in on the language. So my onomatopoeia, that's a language device, and then, oh, sentence level structure because I've used minor which is a sentence structure and sentence level structure because I've used exclamative with a sentence function so literally in three words I've hit three critical terms okay uh, it not only calls to the reader in a colloquial voice but also carries connotations of secrecy because I'm drawing attention to the connotations of the word choices I'm hitting language appropriate to the topic of this piece this is immediately followed with a rhetorical question so again i'm hitting sentence level structure encouraging the readers to consider joining mi6 it's an elliptical phrase that basically just means that the 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 writer has cut out a couple of the sentence the words of the sentence you still get the meaning want to join but grammatically you should say do you want to join but that's what makes it feel really informal so there's sentence level structure again adding to the informal tone. So do you see how in this paragraph I have managed to make sure that I'm hitting everything? I start with whole text structure, I then evidence it, and then I analyse that evidence with language devices and sentence level structure. So there's no way that I'm getting capped at six marks. So really what I would say to you even if you're tempted to go, oh, paragraph on language, paragraph on structure, that means I'm definitely going to hit it. You, you're missing a trick because here I have managed to cram so much into one paragraph. It means that I'm going to cover range. If I can do two or three more of those, I'm golden. We're going to pause there. Even though we're only a third of the way through the paper, you need a break. Um, and um, you can tune back in to have a little look at text two with questions four to six. We'll stay with this same paper. If you haven't subscribed, do click that button and then you'll see exactly when the next section gets posted. If you've got any questions about questions one to three or any other part of the English GCSE, do just drop me a line in the comments and I will get back to you. That's it from me. Thank you so much for watching. Happy revising.